Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship here at Braddock Street Church, excuse me, where we strive to be followers of Jesus, loving God in worship, loving others in small groups, and serving the world in mission. My name is Annalise, and along with Pastor Kirk, we are the pastors here at Braddock Street, and we're so glad that you all are joining us for worship today. There are a few things that we would like for you to know as we get started. First of all, if you are new to us, you will find a green card in the pew rack in front of you, and we'd love it if you would take a moment to fill that out so that we can get to know you a little bit better. And you can leave this in the offering plate for us. And if you have a prayer request this morning, we have these blue cards in that same location, and you can fill these out, and we will collect them during our first hymn so that we can pray over all of those requests together later on in our service. We also want to say good morning to everybody who's with us online. We're so glad that you all are here. Thank you for being with us. Know that you can leave a prayer request right there in the Facebook comments and say good morning and say hello. Let us know that you're with us. And also, if you are new to us today and you're online, you'll find a digital sign-in card in the Facebook comments as well. You can click through that link, fill out that form real quick so that we can get to know you better too. Now, is Mary Lou Zikafus here? Do we see her here this morning? We are going to celebrate her 100th birthday tomorrow, so you will hear that prayer lifted up later on in our service, but we wanted to recognize her if she was here today. But for now, I'd like to invite you to stand as you are able and join in our call to worship. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Please join in our opening prayer. God of our birth, God of our joys and sorrows, God who promises deliverance from all evil, now and forever. You send to us prophets to speak your truth. You send to us priests to lead us in worship and remind us of your loving presence. Remind us again to trust in you and in you alone. For your servants are flawed and only Christ is pure and true. Only you are our rock and our salvation. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning will be number 577, God of Grace and God of Glory.
may be seated. Good morning, I'm Ellen Cavanaugh, one of your faith community nurses, and today's scripture comes from 2 Kings, chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elijah said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they bent down to, went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elisha said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up, struck the water, and the water parted to one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing. Yes, if you see me as I'm being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water saying, which is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and then to the other and Elijah went over. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. My name is Kirk Nave, one of the pastors here. Um, if this is your first Sunday, I'm the guest preacher. <laughs> um, because what's going on is this is my last Sunday here at Braddock Street Church. And um, thank all of you for being here. Um, Diane Kelly this morning said, I'm very emotional, so if I cry, it's okay. And I said, Diane, if I cry, it's okay. So be with me. Um, Today we continue our worship series entitled Old School. We're looking at Old Testament stories that are very important. And yes, I absolutely chose this one just for this day. We have talked about Abraham and Sarah. We have talked about Isaac and Rebecca. We talked about Jacob and Leah and Rachel. We talked about Joshua and Rahab. And today, Elijah and Elisha. Let us pray. Holy God, transitions are hard. Let us hear again that whatever happens, the story remains the same. You are a God of deliverance. And it was never about human power, but all about you and your power to deliver us from all evil. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. It's an emotional day. It's an emotional day for some of you. It's an emotional day, certainly for me. Um, I've never served a congregation for 12 years. And as I look at the wall of shame in the hallway as you come in, that's the, the former pastors of the church. Yeah, my, my picture's up there. And if you want to know how long I've been here, look at the color of my hair when I got here. <laughs> I don't think any of those other pastors have been here for 12 years. So there's something I need to say before I dig in too deep. Um, Know that I will not return. Some of you are like, you're going to come back and visit, aren't you? Well, some folks weren't raised in the United Methodist Church. uh, Yesterday at annual conference, our bishop ordained a number of clergy and among the historic questions, she added a couple. One was, will you go where you are sent? United Methodist pastors are sent. If you come from another tradition, you may have pastors that are called after a search committee goes and calls. We are sent by the bishop. She asked, will you go where you're sent? And then she asked, will you stay away from where you have been? And there's a reason for that. You need to give Jason Dooley every opportunity. And if my shadow hangs over your fond memories here, and you'll hear me speak to that in a moment, uh, Jason won't have a chance. Know also that Stephanie and I love you, and we have loved our time here. We have loved the Winchester Frederick County community. Um, But as we do that, and as we share these emotions, remember our human tendency to remember the past in a romantic way, right? The good old days, our parents used to say. Wait a minute, didn't you come through the the Depression? (laughs) Didn't you have a world war? Wasn't there Korea? On and on you can go, right? The good old days. And they really weren't as good as we remember them. I always say I have a photogenic memory. Um, I remember ways the way that I like to remember them. It's not the way it really happened. So some of us are remembering things more fondly than, than we, they really were, and we're having anxiety about the future. Change always brings anxiety because we don't know fully what the future is going to look like. What we hear from Scripture today is that the story of God, God's love and God's redemptive love continues while the human characters change. Today in Scripture, we have a a transition. Elijah, the great prophet, friends, come on. When you have a Passover Seder, if you ever go to those with one of your friends, there's the cup of Elijah at the Seder. They are waiting for Elijah to come to announce the coming of the Messiah. How do you follow Elijah? Elisha has these shoes to fill. And as we consider this, Scripture this morning, uh, there's a couple of things in the minor details that I want to lift up. I've got a map here um, for you to look at, and there are three cities named, Bethel, Gilgal, and Jericho. Bethel's the second one named, and, you know, when you're walking from point A to point B, it's a straight line, right? Why go from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho and then east across the Jordan? What Elijah is doing is going in reverse those very same places where the people of God came into the land of Canaan, right? We came in this way, I'm going out. 
So it's in reverse uh, order. And listen to what Elijah says to Elisha in verse 2. He says it three times. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. He does it three times. And Elisha is like that abandoned dog that just won't go away. He just keeps coming. Why? Because if you're serious about this, you need to show persistence. You need to show endurance. You are called to this work because it's going to be tough. To this day, if you were to go to the synagogue and ask the rabbi, I want to convert to Judaism, the rabbi is supposed to turn you away three times because being Jewish is hard, right? We know that. We've seen that throughout history. We've seen it in our own society, and we know it's hard to follow Jesus, too. It's hard to be Christian. We need to consider our commitment before we really jump in. Among the words we heard at the annual conference session from our own Bishop Sue Halpert Johnson, she said, far too many Christians believe that all I have to do is check the box and attend worship 1.4 times each month. That's the national average now. 1.4 times each month and give an offering that Sunday that's about the equivalence of my cable or streaming service bill. And, th- and then I've fulfilled all that is required of me. Forgetting the path of Jesus. He didn't do most of his ministry. Yes, he worshipped. Yes, he prayed daily. But then he was sent beyond the ministry of the synagogue. He spent most of his ministry outside the synagogue. He went to the very people the religious leaders intentionally taught people to stay away from. Gentiles, tax collectors, lepers, sex workers. These are the people that Jesus went to. And then he turns to you and me and he says, follow me. And he keeps doing it until they kill him. Come on, follow me. You want a piece of this? So yes, Elijah asks Elisha three times, you want a piece of this? Stay here. No, I'm coming. Stay here. No, I'm. he won't go away. It's an indication to Elijah that God has truly called him. Following Jesus is hard. Being at annual conference this week, and if you're not United Methodist, that's when all the clergy and a lay representative from each congregation go and have all their, their business meeting. And there's a youth delegation there. And I remembered being 16 years old in the youth delegation. And I was so inspired by all the things that God was doing through the church at large. As, as my parents and I left the annual conference session, you know, we got in the car ready to drive home, and I'm in the back seat. And I said, Dad, I think God might be calling me to go into the ministry. Some of you knew my dad. And you know he had a common sense sense of humor. And he said, well, son, it's just like getting married. Don't do it if you can get out of it. (laughs) And my mother punched him in the shoulder, you know. But I heard what he was saying. You got to be that committed. We need to be that committed to follow Jesus, friends, whether we're clergy or laity. It doesn't matter. Following Jesus is hard. But speaking of the clergy again, uh, there was just an article published in USA Today on May the 26th. So this is fresh information. I'm going to read to you a couple of paragraphs. It's entitled, For American Clergy, the Burdens of Their Calling is increase, Increasingly Threatens Mental Well-Being. According to the Clergy Health Initiative, a project of Duke Divinity School in Durham, North Carolina, clergy are among the nation's nation's most overworked individuals, juggling multiple roles while often raising their own families, but tensions triggered in recent years have added to the strain, right? We know the struggles of the recent years, creating mental health challenges and prompting many to reconsider their callings. A survey of 1,700 clergy sponsored by the Hartford Institute for Religious Research last fall showed high levels of discontent among the nation's Christian clergy, nearly half said they thought about leaving their congregations, while more than half said they considered leaving the ministry altogether. Following Jesus is hard, and it's harder now more than ever. Um, Your own Tom Berlin, uh, for those of you that don't know, a young boy raised in this congregation is now Bishop Tom Berlin from Florida, spoke at the ordination service yesterday, and he talked to the ordinands about how it's harder now than it used to be. He said, some of us in the room are old enough to remember the 90s, 
Remember how great the 90s were? You just had a worship service and people would just show up to your church. It's harder now. There's one in three people in this country have been hurt by the church and aren't coming back. It takes a cup of coffee and building relationships outside the church. Taking time to build those relationships and help them rediscover that God might just be worth their time. How do you follow Elijah? Elijah reminds Elisha, before you begin, know that it's tough. (laughs) But how do you follow Elijah, the one who's going to be revered forever? It's better to be that Elijah, right, after the fact. One of our family friends, Bishop Kern Utzler, once said, the best thing in the world to be is a former pastor. (laughs) Emphasis on the word former. Because, again, we remember the past fondly, and we forget the challenges, right? And we've had a good ride for 12 years here together. I'm a data nerd, so I went back and I looked it up. All those year-end statistics, some, some clergy in the room know what that report is. We received 531 members during my time here. 531. Now, that doesn't mean the church grew by 531 people. Because at the same time, what was going on was we lost a number of our loved ones. We also had some people leave our congregation over time for moves and other things. But let's just focus on the good news of 531 new people, millions of dollars that were raised, that you raised, to make the capital improvements necessary to keep this place open and serving our community through Boy Scouts, child care, preschool, um, Narcotics Anonymous. You have no idea how this building gets used. It's marvelous. Then there are those relational things. Those of us that are ordained, we get to be a part of people's greatest celebrations and deepest woes. I remember baptisms. Oh, my golly. They... I at least pulled my heartstrings at the 10 o'clock service during the children's service. And she said, Pastor Kirk baptized a lot of you. And I remembered, not only did I baptize some of these folks, I watched some of the ones that I baptized later get confirmed. And some of those that were confirmed graduate from high school. And then I thought, what God did with me as a child and as a youth, you know how we're, we're more spiritually pliable when we're kids? How God imprints things when we're young You know, we get old and surly. God can't do much with us. But when we're young, right? And I got to be a part of that. And then there are the somber moments where we, that drew us closer together. Hospital visits, funerals, counseling sessions. And somebody said to me after one of the services today, she just pulled me close and she said, thank you for helping my husband become a believer. It doesn't get any better or more, more humbling than that, friends, to know that you were a part of connecting somebody with God. Marvelous stuff to remember, right? But we forget the trials. We forget arguments over how we were going to replace the organ. Some of you in the room were right in the crosshairs of that. God bless you. We had disagreements about our Sunday morning schedule, considering changing it. There was the pandemic. The Lord got us through that. But we didn't always agree about how to handle it. There were people who left our church because of how we handled the pandemic. Some never came back. Some went to other congregations for that reason. Then some people left our congregation because of our congregation's response to the 2019 General Conference. All of a sudden, traditionalist Christians thought, oh my gosh, Braddock Street is more progressive than I thought it was. Let's remember those things as well, the challenges that God brought us through. We have a selective memory. Now, Elijah did something amazing during his time as a prophet. He delivered the people of Israel not from slavery. He delivered them from worshiping other gods, forgetting who they were. There's this beautiful story of the duel of the gods on Mount Carmel. If you've never heard it, you need to take up and read it. Where the the prophets of Baal the Canaanite gods, were were asked for a challenge. We're going to build an altar, put wood on it, put your animals on it, douse it with water, and then call on your gods to bring fire upon the altar. And they went around, and they prayed, and they wailed, and they danced, and Elijah started taunting them. Where is your God? Did your God fall asleep? Is Is your God gone to the bathroom? 
Seriously, he did it. Look it up. And then he called upon God to light the fire of the one true God. And guess who showed up, right? Beautiful story. This is the one that Israel will revere forever. We forget the part where he had to run for his life after that, went up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and showed serious signs of clinical depression until God spoke to him in the still, small voice. How do you follow somebody like that? That's why Elisha insisted He kept coming back three times. Let's move on to verse 8. Then Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. Oh boy. Any of you who know the story of Israel, when you see water getting divided, right, it brings the memory of the story of God's power, doesn't it? We remember how they entered into the land of Canaan. Joshua and the priests of God, the representatives of the 12 tribes, took the Ark of the Covenant and the water parted. The water of the River Jordan parted on both sides. We remember the Red Sea story with Moses. They were delivered from slavery by going through the Red Sea and the water was parted on both sides. They walked through on dry ground. Wow, same God. The human characters change, don't they? But it's the same God, and it's the same story of God's deliverance. Remember those stories where God has delivered. Remember those stories in your life where God was with you. I told somebody before this started, I said, I don't like doing this three times this morning. But I'm looking around the room, and I have seen people in our room this morning who almost died seeing them in the hospital room and seeing their stories of deliverance, other stories of deliverance that were spiritual and emotional. That's your story of God's deliverance. When the human characters change, all that stays, right? So smack the water. Remember that it parts. The same God shows up. And Elisha has a request when they had crossed in verse 9. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. The Hebrew is a little bit more humorous. It's literally a double mouthful. Right? See if you can swallow this, Elisha. It's a double mouthful. And the rabbis who study these stories, they count eight Miracles for Elijah, the former prophet. And they count 16 for Elisha, the prophet that followed through. Right? You think because human characters change, the power of God is not among you and and that even greater things will be done? There's another transition that's important in the scriptures. The transition of the bodily Jesus through death and resurrection. We find these words in John chapter 14. This is after the Last Supper. Most of us remember the part about, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? We remember that when we think about our own death or the death of a loved one. But Jesus also said in the very same story, Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I don't know about you, but if I heard that, I'm like, what? Jesus? Greater works than you. Greater works than you. And because I am going to the Father, because the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the life of the church to do even greater things that Jesus himself did. How many people did Jesus feed? 5,000? In my 12 years here, how many people have we fed? How many meals during Monday night dinner? How many meals to kids in public schools? through our backpack ministry? How many giving tree gifts have been given? How many hygiene kits have been prepared? How many rise against hunger meals have we prepared? How many nights of shelter have we prepared for the homeless? How many English language lessons taught? I could go on and on and on about what God has done and will continue to do through you. Because Jesus went to the Father. And in spite of the fact that I'm about to go, Human characters change, but the power of God remains the same. 
Look what happened for Elisha at the end of the story, verses 13 and 14. Elisha, he picked up the mantle of Elijah. That would have been like the prayer shawl, kind of like our stoles. Picked up the mantle that Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He, Elisha, I love this. I can imagine him picking up the same stole. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord God, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the left. What? Parting water again? Same story? And Elijah went over. And he went over with every confidence. Because there it was. The power of God to deliver. To deliver each one of us from our sinfulness. And to deliver each one of us from our self-centeredness into servants of Jesus Christ in a world that needs him so badly. Let us pray. Almighty God, again, transitions are hard, but it was always about you. It wasn't about Elijah or Elisha. It was never about Kirk or Jason. It's about you and your power among us to do amazing things, to deliver us, to deliver others. So today we just want to say thank you and be with us as we grieve and go through transition times. But as we pray for ourselves, we pray for our neighbors as well. We pray today for the family of George Morris, for the family of Nancy Berlin, for Megan Pugh, for Ann White, for Gloria Wayham, for Dr. Curtis Thwing and his family, for Harold Og and Lucinda Angel, for David Andre, Liz Eppinger, Ralph and Dee Grimm, Shirley Peterson, Candace Grimm, Lynette Harmon, John Laub, Bertel Wamalink, the family of Shirley Ballard, we celebrate with Mary Lou Zickafoos this week, her 100th birthday. We pray for Holly Fuller, for Dennis White, for Chris Graham. We pray for Lisa, for Doug Cavender, for the family of Cindy Stewart, for Mark Lewis, for Mary Fleming, Marcy Fleming, for Kevin Hanrahan, for Isabel Garcia, and for others whom we name in our hearts. We give you thanks also, Lord, for the Virginia United Methodist Church, the connection of the annual conference, and we praise you for a great celebration. And we pray, Lord, for our neighbors throughout the world, especially for peace. Again, we pray for deliverance from gun violence. We pray for peace in Gaza. We pray for peace in Ukraine. And wherever there is violence, Lord, bring the reign of the Prince of Peace that we might stop killing each other. And these prayers we offer in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has also taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is important to us here at Braddock Street that you all know what kind of wonderful things we are able to do because of your generosity. And one of the things that we did consistently before the pandemic was to send adult mission teams out to do projects. And we've heard and felt some movement of the Holy Spirit and some folks who would really like to get those teams back up and running again. And we are so excited about that. If that's something that sparks something in you, please let us know as we are really just at the beginnings of building those teams and we would love to have you on them. So thank you for being the kind of church that cares enough to send people of all ages out in mission. And I want to say, just in case any of you think that you're off the hook because you're too young or too old, that I have been on mission teams where our youngest member was five and our oldest was 90. So you are not exempt. If you are feeling this call on your heart, please let us know so that we can help connect you to the other folks that would love to be in mission also. We'll invite our ushers to come forward to receive this morning's offering as we hear together this offertory.
us pray. Holy God, we give with joy into your kingdom today and ask that you would bless these gifts and us to your service. Amen. We invite you to remain standing as you are able and join us in affirming our faith as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What we're going to do right now is... Um a liturgy of written just for this occasion. You'll find it in the Book of Worship of the United Methodist Church in case you're wondering. But it's a liturgy of farewell to a pastor. I thank you members of Braddock Street United Methodist Church for the love and support you have shown me while I have served Christ with you. I'm grateful for the ways my leadership has been accepted. I ask forgiveness for the mistakes I have made as I leave I carry with me all that I have learned here. We receive your thankfulness, offer forgiveness, and accept that we serve Christ elsewhere. We express our gratitude for We ask your forgiveness for our mistakes. Your influence on our faith and faithfulness will not leave us with your departure. I accept your gratitude and forgiveness, and I forgive you, trusting that our time together and our parting are pleasing to God. I release you from turning to me and depending on me. I encourage your ministry here and will pray for you and your new pastor, Jason Dooley. And as I do that, as Elijah laid down his stole, as we say on social media, I'll just leave this here. And I invite you to sing together a hymn that was my mother's favorite hymn. In case you didn't know, I love to tell stories. And my favorite story is the story of God's love in our lives. So let us sing together. I love to tell the story.
It has been a blessing to be in worship with you today. Thank you for being here. There are a few things we want you to know as we go. First of all, we have 149 kids signed up for our Vacation Bible School. Yeah, praise God. 149. And so we added a few in the last week, um, which means that we are in need of two more adult volunteers to help us share God's love with children this week. So we hope that you, if you are willing to do so, would let us know they get here tomorrow. So please do sign up to help us out. And one of the most amazing things is that the first Bible story that we get to teach the kids is Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Holy Spirit did something really cool that that happens to be the last lesson that Pastor Kirk is going to teach us here, and the first one that we get to teach to a new generation of believers tomorrow. So we hope that you'll come and join us. And speaking of our farewell, it starts in about 20 minutes, so please join us over as we say goodbye to Kirk and thank him for his ministry. But first, can we thank him right now? And we're going to ask him to bring us a benediction. Before I do, I know there are a number of retired clergy in the room. You've had to do this and I just want to say it publicly, um, I'm not your pastor anymore. Um, so please don't ask me to do your weddings or your funerals, because you need to give Jason every chance to build a beautiful relationship with you. We say goodbye to old friends, and we say hello to new friends. And as I've said many times, you're going to love Jason. It's going to be wonderful. God will do even greater things in the future because it was never about me. It's not going to be about Jason ultimately. It's about the power of God. So smack the water, see what God does, and go forward with that assurance and that confidence and the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.